Hey everybody, it's Mrs. Randock coming from you live from my kitchen. And I just thought I would maybe try to bring some sparkle to your unexpected time at home. I know I'm a little frazzled a little bit. I'm kind of bored already. So anyway, I thought I would read you a story. And I went to Target the other night and I found this really cool story. And I didn't even realize how cool it was till just now. A couple of really important things. First of all, on the front cover, there is a quote by one of my favorite kid authors, Christopher Paul Curtis, who wrote definitely one of my favorite kid books called Bud Not Buddy. If you have not read it, I definitely recommend it. And it is, his quote is, a book that deserves to be eaten by young people. Imagine that. A book so good it deserves to be eaten. So in Bud Not Buddy, there's this little guy and he's he's got it down on his luck and but he has the best attitude ever and he goes through life and he has these things called his rules and and here's an example of rules and things from Bud Not Buddy. Rules and things number 63. Never ever say something bad about someone you don't know, especially when you're around a bunch of strangers. You never can tell who might be kin to that person or who might be a lip-flapping, big-mouth spy. And that's that's a, a cute little story. Um, really, totally enjoyed it. So if you can go find that one, that would be a great book to read. Anyway, so as I was looking at this book by Nick Stone, this is Nick Stone. She is an award-winning author. She's a graduate of Spelman College, which is a historically black university. She also wrote a book called Dear Martin, which maybe some of us are familiar with. And um, she lives in Atlanta with her adorable little family. And this is her first middle grade novel. So here's the story. When I opened up the book, it's called Clean Getaway. And then there's the title page, of course. And then here's the dedication for Jason Reynolds. I don't know who that is. Here's the thing that made me go, oh my goodness. Here's a quote from a guy who I just happened to have met recently in a book that I read called Just Mercy, Brian Stevenson, who is amazing. And if you've heard of this, this is the movie that's out right now in the theaters with Michael B. Jordan and Jamie Foxx. So now that I've read the book, I must watch the movie because I always read the books first. But this is one of the quotes that I read just recently that I absolutely loved. And sure enough, here it is in the front of this book. So this was absolutely meant to be. Each of us is more than the worst thing we've ever done. Let that sit in your brain for a minute. What a profound thing to say. Anyway, so here's the deal about this story. It cracks me right up. This is... A young man, his name is Scoob Lamar. For the life of him, William Scoob Lamar can't seem to stay out of trouble. Hmm, sounds like some people I know. And uh, maybe even me. And now the run-ins at school have led to a lockdown at home. So when Jima, Scoob's favorite person on the earth, asks him to, asks him to go on an impromptu road trip, that means last minute, surprising, He's in the RV faster than he can say freedom. With Jima's old map and a strange pamphlet called The Traveler's Green Book. Another great connection, which is a fabulous movie. If you haven't seen that, go check it out. At their side, the pair takes off on a journey down Jima's memory lane. But adventure quickly turns to uncertainty. Jima keeps changing the license plate. Hmm, that's weird. Dodging Scoob's questions and refusing to check dad's voicemails. And the farther they go, the more Scoob realizes that the world has not always been a welcoming place for kids like him. And things aren't always what they seem, Jima included. So I read that and I thought, oh wow, this sounds terrific. So let's see what's going on. There is Scoob and Jima. So let's dive right in. Here we go. 
There's even some pictures in the book, so I'll be sure to share those. So this is the first one. Chapter one, route one, quite a ways to go. It might sound silly, but to William Scoob Lamar, the Welcome to Alabama, the Beautiful sign looks, well, beautiful. Not as beautiful as his best friend Shanice Lockwood in her yellow sundress, but beautiful enough to make Scoob tip his head back, close his eyes, and sigh into the breeze blowing through the open passenger side window of Gma's Winnebago. And if you don't know what a Winnebago is, that's what a Winnebago is. That's very cool. <sighs> Exhale, Dad's lockdown. Inhale the sweet fragrance of freedom, which smells like pine mixed with a bunch of truck exhaust. <laughs> Y'all right over there, scuba doob? Gma says from the driver's seat. Oh my God, look at this one. She's propped up on a gingham covered foam wedge she uses to see over the steering wheel. Pale polka dotted little hands positioned perfectly at 10 and two. She's only four feet 11. Gma is, oh my God, that's three inches shorter than me even. Hearing his full nickname makes Scoob cringe. Gma gave it to him when he was five years old and obsessed with an old cartoon he used to watch at her house about a dog who liked to solve mysteries. Gma thought it was just too adorable that he couldn't pronounce Scooby-Doo. And because Shanice was Gma's neighbor, she picked up on the nickname and started using it at school and it stuck. Well, the Scoob part did, which is fine. Kind of cool even. Scuba doob though? Mm, no. Gma, he says, you mind if we stick to Scoob? The rest is a little, mm, babyish. No offense, he adds. Oh, none taken, Gma says. My apologize, Mr. Scoob. I mean, you can drop the Mr. too, Scoob goes on. <laughs> this makes Gma laugh, which makes Scoob smile. He'd never tell anybody, but there's really no sound in the world. He loves more than his grandmother's barking laughter. Dad's not a fan, says it grates on him because it's the one reminder of Gma's past smoking days and potential future lung cancer. But it reminds Scoob of elementary school days playing card games she taught him that he wasn't supposed to know the rules for, like Texas Hold'em and Blackjack. Sidebar. We play blackjack in my class, except we call it 21. Anyway, back to the story. Even now, it blows Scoob's mind that a harsh, booming sound like that could come out of a person as little as Gma. I mean it, though, she says. You feeling all right? I'm not driving too fast, am I? She kicks him a winkly, wrinkly wink. Now Scoob's the one laughing. He looks up from the brand new road map she handed him once they were both settled and seat belted. According to the speedometer, the brand new Winnebago he and Gma are in has a max speed of 120 miles per hour. But Gma has yet to push the needle past 60. Oh, um, mm, definitely not too fast, Gma. Though I do wonder if there is a minimum speed limit law you're breaking. Oh, you hush, she says. Speaking of which, you never said if you liked my new sweet ride or not. That's what you kids call it these days, right? A sweet ride? She says it in a way that makes her sound like a smarmy used car, car salesman with oil slicked hair. Scoob chuckles and he shucks his head. And then he peeks over his shoulder into the back. Truthfully, when Gma popped out of the little out of the blue, and asked Scoob if he wanted to go on a little adventure. He was too geeked at the thought of a loophole in his punishment to give much thought to anything else. Their destination included. Here, I'm going to put this on their picture so you can see them while I'm reading. Oops. There we go. Especially when she'd said he'd probably miss a couple of days of school. Bonus! He finished item three. Empty the dishwasher. On the to-do list, Dad left him in the kitchen whiteboard every day and grabbed his suitcase. And then 
after scribbling dad a quick note about being with Jima for the night. Scoob hightailed it out of the house as fast as his off-brand sneaker-clad feet would carry him, even left his phone at home. Largely so dad couldn't call him, <laughs> but he won't tell Jima that. The suitcase had been sitting in suit Scoob's closet for a month. Dad promised Scoob a trip to St. Simon's Island this year. Scoob's first choice was Universal Studios, but Dad said Scoob was too old for all of that. He'd been too young the previous year, but pfft, whatever. So Scoob packed up, according to Dad's specifications, three days before they were supposed to depart. Except they didn't go. Scoob got in trouble at school and voila, the trip was canceled. Lockdown commenced. Spring break ruined before it could begin. Scoob hadn't been able to bring himself to unpack the bag, so he hid it. And now he can see it sitting in the seat on the dining booth of Grandma's new sweet ride. Scoob was in such a rush to get it out, it didn't fully click that he and Jima weren't in the Mini Cooper until she asked him to get out of his seat while the vehicle was in motion and grab a GPS from the fridge. That's Grandma Protein Shake, otherwise known as Ensure for her. Fridge, Scoop thought, light bulb slowly illuminating. That's when he looked behind him for the first time and almost choked on the gum that shot down his throat when he gasped. <gasps> Ain't he handsome, Jima said, smacking the dashboard twice. Brand spankin' knew this fella. I decided to call him senior after your late grandfather. He and I had a Winnebago back in the day before your dad was born, and your G-pop. Mm. Then, anyway, I ain't getting any younger. Sold my house and bought this baby. You sold your house, Scoop said. Stunned, sure did. Fetched a pretty penny for it, too. God bless home equity and hipsters looking to revitalize or whatever the heck they're calling it. Wow. Was there anything else he could have said? She'd sold her house. Well, you gonna get me a GPS or not? Scoob gulped, removed his seatbelt, and made his way to the back. Dad would have breathed fire and shot smoke out of his ears if he'd been around to see and he opened the for real, for real fridge with a separate freezer. Jima gave him a rundown of Senior's features. You see those lights above your head? Scoob looked up. Yeah, those are LEDs, she said. Real state of the art. There's also a microphone. I mean, sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. There's a, also a microwave, a two burner cooktop stove, and two Ultra HD TVs, where you can watch anything. Rated PG and lower, that is. Uh, Scoob rolled his eyes. Jima pushed on. Bathroom's there to the left of the mini pantry. It's got a flushing toilet and a shower. And that dining booth you see back there doubles as a bed. And speaking of beds, there's one in the rear for me and there's one right above the cab here for you. There's a window up there and everything, kiddo. Scoob could hear the proud smile in her voice, which made him smile too, despite the fact that she'd called him kiddo. I totally get it, I hate that word too. As he grabbed the drink for Jima and saw that the fridge was fully stocked, Scoob realized he'd never again play on the old tire swing in Jima's backyard or kick back on the old window seat in the attic with his favorite book. When it hit him that this this bizarre truck that contained everything a person needs to live. This thing was now Jima's house? Creepy. Jima's figures, fingers do a tap dance on the steering wheel, pulling him back into the present, and he takes a deep breath and lets his eyes continue to roam around the space behind him. It's so weird to him that if he has to pee, all he's got to do is walk 15 feet to the little bathroom, and it flushes. Where does the stuff even go? It's not like they're connected to a sewer. And what about the dirty dish and shower water? Jima's house had one of those old school bathtubs with the fancy metal feet and Scoob secretly loved to get in with one or two of the lemon sized balls 
Jima would buy that would fizz up like Alka-Seltzer and turn the bath all kinds of wild colors. Plop, fish, and the water would go blue and kind of shimmery. It's like taking a soak in the galaxy. This RV doesn't have a tub, so no more galaxy baths. His gaze catches on the kitchenette thingy as he faces forward. I can't imagine Jima making her blue ribbon winning cast iron French toast. First pan toasted, then baked in the pan for a few minutes to extra crispiness on the outside. No more extra sweet Arnold Palmer's on the porch swing. No more reading in front of the fire. In all honesty, the RV gave Scoob the willies. But of course he can't tell Jima that, not when she's so excited about it. Well, she says, taking her baby blue eyes off the road to look at him, second only to Shanice's honey brown eyes. Grandma's got the prettiest eyes Scoob's ever seen. What do you think, kid? Scoob traces the handle of his door and goops and gulps down his feelings. I think it's great, Jima, he says with forced enthusiasm. Whether or not she can tell he's lying, Scoob doesn't, Scoob doesn't know. Good, she says, settle on in. We got quite a ways to go. All right, so I'm gonna read two chapters for just this one time. After that, it's gonna be one chapter each time. So this is it. This next chapter is called Pay the Bill. Um, I think there's another picture coming up. No, oh, just a little one. Anyway, the trouble really started six months back during those weird three weeks of school in between Thanksgiving and winter break. You guys remember that? That was a while ago. Scoob's got no idea why, but over the course of that stretch, by Bryce Benedict, a kid Scoob used to be friends with until he started playing footy ball and got too big for his britches. I wonder what the heck footy ball is. Jima likes to say, and he started picking on Shanice's little brother, Drake. You see, Drake has epilepsy, which was never a big deal until Bryce's antics began. Things started pretty light, mm, like usual. Bryce would make unnecessary detours past Scoob, Shanice, and Drake's table in the cafeteria to tap Drake on the back of the head. And he would shout, Sup, Drakey Drake? Loud enough for the whole room to hear. After a few days of this, the tapping turned to shoving, and then it turned to smacking. There was one morning Bryce hit so hard, Drake cried out in pain. The nearest teacher hadn't been paying attention. If she had been, Bryce probably wouldn't have done it. But when she turned to see what had happened, Bryce was gone and Drake said nothing. So no one else said anything either. The following day, Bryce, Bryce cornered Drake in the hallway to taunt him. What a jerk this guy sounds like. Scoob arrived just as Drake's arms jerked out of their own accord and he dropped all the books he was holding. Of course, old Bryce found this and Shanice's protective punch in the chest, hilarious. I guess Blake, I guess Drake was having an epileptic episode. He shoved Drake's shoulder hard and walked off just as Scoob rushed over to help Shanice and Drake with the books. As they gathered everything, Scoob could tell Drake was fighting with everything he had to keep from crying. Oh, I guess he didn't have an episode. Shanice was crying. For the first time in his life, Scoob experienced a violent urge. He wanted to smack Bryce upside his fat head. Whew, Grandma says, as Scoob relays the story to her over an early dinner. They're at a place called Damn Yankees, and the lemon pepper wings truly are smoking, just like the menu said. The decor is a bit much country. Got rodeo posters and horseshoes and cowboy hats all over the walls. Lassos and saddles hanging from the ceiling. There's even a mounted bull's head. Massive horns, menacingly outstretched. Can't blame you, Scoobadoob, GMAT continues. Scoob sighs, grateful some grown-up in his life seems to understand. 
I knew you'd get it, Jima, because she always does. He shrugged it off and said he was just being a bully, which made me even madder. I bet. Hard seeing someone you care about brush that kind of thing off, ain't it? Scoob nods, it really is. As the days wore on, Bryce's taunting got more intense. One day after school, Shanice confided in Scooby, Scoob, excuse me, that Drake hadn't been sleeping real well, that he'd been having bad dreams, and she was pretty sure that they had to do with Bryce picking on him, that he'd been having more seizures, despite taking his medicines like he was supposed to. Uh, that's when I started noticing that Drake would like blink out at random times. Scoob says to Jima, there was even a day someone was talking to him at lunch table and he didn't even respond. He was just staring straight ahead. People had looked around at each other and started whispering and on Drake sat perfectly still, blinking, blinking, blinking. Bryce passed by and hit him, and Drake's whole body lurched forward like a board, which Bryce thought was hilarious. Scoob's eyes narrowed as the anger begins to simmer again. He pointed one of his fat pink fingers at Drake and laughed, imitated Drake's blinks. Looks like he's having one of his seizures, he said. He did air quotes and everything. Scoob shakes his head. Gma shakes hers too. Then he said, too bad it's not the type where he shakes and his tongue falls out. And he stuck his big, ugly tongue out and pretended to convulse. Shanice jumped up and said something I won't repeat. And then Bryce looked at her like the evil villains do in the cartoons just before they hurt people. And when he took a step towards her, I... <sighs> Scoob sighs. I lost it, Jima. I just, I just kind of snapped. Scoob will never forget hearing Mrs. Manasmith gasp as he leapt from his seat, hopped the table, and tackled Bryce. They were on the floor, Bryce on his back, Scoob on top of him, punching, punching, punching. Scoob's got no idea how long he punched. He just knows that at some point, one of the punches failed to connect because he was flying up, up, up. And by the time his surroundings came into focus, there was no longer a youngish white lady staring at him, but a little old brown-skinned dude, Mr. Armand, the principal of Casey M. Weeks Middle Magnet School. Soon, that dude was joined by a big, slightly light brown-skinned dude, Dr. James Robert Lamar Jr., Scoob's father. And that was the beginning of the end. Scoob says to Jima as he rips another hunk of lemony pepper meat from a chicken leg. Um, the end of what exactly? Jima's eating Roy oysters. Ugh. Scoob shuts his eyes as she picks up a shell and tips the gob of gross, <laughs> that's what I call him too, into her now snaggletooth mouth. She removes her partial. Oh my God, I hate when my mother does that. That's false teeth that can come out of your mouth, by the way. The thought of the false teeth currently chilling in their purple glitter container inside Jima's purse almost grosses Scoob out as much as the oysters. Oh my God, this is gross. Scoob shudders and he takes a sip of sweet tea to clear his head. Sorry, sorry, what was the question? Jima smiles. You said the fight with Bryce, the bonehead, was the beginning of the end. The end of what? Oh, oh, Scoob says lowering his eyes to his near empty plate. The end of, well, dad's faith in me, I guess. Not that dad would listen to Scoob when Scoob tried to explain why he did it. You think about a police officer will care about you defending a friend when they toss you in jail for aggravated assault. Dad said on the way home from school to begin dad, Scoob's three day suspension. You can't react violently to someone else's words, especially someone like Bryce, when boys like you, he pointed to the brown back of Scoob's hand, hit boys like him. He opened his own hand and pointed to his pale palm. The punishment is harder and the fallout indefinitely worse, William. Scoob will never forget dad's look of disappointment. Seems a tad extreme, don't you think? 
Grandma says, plucking Scoob back to the present. Oh, he shakes his head. Not really. He used to tell me he had faith in me all the time. And now he acts like I'm some kind of hardened delinquent. It's like he thinks there's no hope for me or something. Won't even look me in the eye anymore. Especially since the other incident. The one with the computers, Jima says. Yep. Jima doesn't press any further, which Scoob is thankful for. He really doesn't want to get into that now. He takes another swig of sweet tea to swallow the little ball that has risen in his throat. That's the first time he's spoken aloud about the way dad's been to him lately. Kind of makes him want to cry, but he won't. Though he can totally feel Jima looking at him and he knows from the way the hairs on the back of his neck are rising. She's doing the thing where she tries to see inside of his head. If he looks at her now, she sees all the other mess. Scoob's frustration over the fact that Bryce wasn't punished, his annoyance that all the teachers look at him like he's a lit stick of dynamite now, despite that Bryce is still terrorizing people, but not Drake anymore. His anger over the unfairness of the whole situation swirling around behind Scoob's eyes. And if she does that, she's going to drag it all out of him. But he doesn't want to tell her any of that. Right now, Scoob just wants to get back in Jima's fancy new drivable home and go. Go, 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 and never look back. He pulls himself straight up and lifts his chin. And that's when he notices an older white man in a baseball cap a few tables over, looking between him and Jima like there's some alien beings. Yeah, kids at school used to ask questions when they'd see Drake and or Scoob and Jima together. He's black and she's white, but this feels different. Less about curiosity and more disdainful. And that guy's not the only one. Bouncing his eyes around the room, Scoob realizes a bunch of people are looking at him and Jima funny. One lady he makes eye contact with openly sneers at him like he's done something wrong. Like he is something wrong, even. It's the same way Dad looked at him when he stepped into Mr. Armand's office that first time after the fight. Ugh. His hand tightens around his damp glass of tea, which he'd really like to pick up and throw right at that woman, give her a reason to look at him the way she is. Jima's warm hand squeezes Scoob's other one, which is resting on the table in a fist. He locks eyes with her and smiles, and she does too. His chest unclenches a little. What do you say we blow this popsicle stand, huh? She asks him. We've eaten our fill. Now, time to eat some road. Scoob nods and grins. Sounds disgusting, Grandma, but let's go. As they make their way outside, Jima turns to him and says, These small towns are really something, aren't they? Bass ackwards, as your G-pop used to say. But that's all right. She doesn't say anything else, and Scoob doesn't respond. But as they pull away from damn Yankees, it hits him. He's pretty sure that Jima didn't pay the bill. Ha! Huh? God, I like this Jima. She reminds me of my grandma, my nana. All right, so here's a preview. Chapter three, root three is called Never Seen Before. You'll have to stay tuned another day to hear that one, guys. Hope you do. This book's going to be awesome. Can't wait to read it with you.